I'd like to welcome the panel and say thank you all so much for being here. Um, as James had just introduced you, um, so I wondered if maybe you could just take a couple of moments each to just introduce us to your businesses and just tell us, perhaps with your marketing hats on, what you think it is that um, makes your business distinctive. So shall we start with you? Tamara. Yes, hi, I'm Tamara Lorne, and uh, with my husband James, I founded Mr. and Mrs. Smith. We are the travel club for boutique hotel lovers. Um, I think what uh, sets us apart from our competition is our relentless um, curation. So nobody else in the market really checks the hotels like we do, so our customers really trust our recommendations. Um, and then the fact that we just go above and beyond from our members in terms of service and added extras and added value. I loved what Julian was saying about, you know, always wow people. Mm. Um, we have a, a proper program in place in, in, in the company to, to try and wow people at every turn. Oh, that's interesting. Well, hopefully we'll hold that thought and come <laughs> on to that. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, Rob, I now realise that actually last weekend was quite a small event for you, wasn't it? <laughs> it was kind of no big deal, really. That one, a few hours. Uh, hey, we managed to get through it, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me here. My oh, name is Rob Van Helden. Um, I've been running Rob Van Helden Floral Design here in London for the last 32 years, together with my sister, who's my business partner, and um, starting up very small, but always having the passion for. Uh, people contact and flowers, the love for flowers and loving my job. Uh, we are still going after 32 years and thanks to the, the goodness of people like Julian and Johnny and Colin and um, Jamie here and many others in this room for, and trusted us with jobs here in England and abroad, uh, we are still going and enjoying still every day of our lives. And are you still quite hands-on with the creative process as well? I'm still there yes, seven days a week. Saying, I'm still yeah. going to the flower market yeah. myself every morning, at least five, mm. if not six days a week. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's the love for my job and every day is different and mm -hmm. that's what keeps me going. Okay, thank you. Emily. So uh, I'm with Mandarin Oriental Hotels. As you said, we have 33 beautiful properties around the world. Um, and one of the things we do very well, we, we like to say we're a celebration destination. I love and I, that. I was, you know, I really, love that. And, and uh, as you all know in this room, but now it's not just weddings, it's parties, it's bar mitzvahs, it's uh, birthday parties, etc. Uh, and Melina Beckett is here in the room. She and I opened the Mandarin in New York many years ago, 15 years ago. And she was one of the most creative. And it really is about the creative passion energy of the staff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lifestyle, right? We do these wonderful, beautiful events and make lifetime memories. So that's what we're, we're good at. Thank you. And finally, Elizabeth um, from Elizabeth's Cake Emporium. I find that hard to say, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> want to tell us what makes your business distinctive? Um, I'm the founder. I'm Elizabeth Solaru, founder of Elizabeth's Cake Emporium. And for me, I think um, a couple of things. One um, is understanding that everybody you meet with, you've got a psychological contract with. So whether negative, whether positive, <laughs> there's a contract there. Mm -hmm. And you need to deposit something into that contract, into that bank to get something back. So mm -hmm. that's number one. And I think the second thing is just the power of being the underdog. <laughs> there's something about being an underdog that I absolutely love. Um, it's about pitting your wits against impossible odds. And I absolutely love that. What makes you say you're the underdog? Um, because when I started Elizabeth's Cake Emporium, um, there was no money, no mm -hmm. connections, oh, I see. Yeah. and nothing at all. Okay. Um, completely different background, came into an industry where I didn't know anybody, and I got used to hearing no, okay. and, which is brilliant, yeah. actually. You know um, your next yes. Then, I think you? Um, there is, you know, the word no is, can be the most empowering thing, mm -hmm. um, and I think also it builds up resilience. Mm -hmm. So you develop a lot of thick skin, resilience, but you keep going. Okay. So that is absolutely what I think makes me stand out. Okay. So we've obviously got a lot of experience on the panel here. We've got, uh, it's interesting, we've got two creatives and two people working in prob probably, am I right in saying, a more corporate environment. So I think that's a nice balance. And um, what I'd like to sort of dig a bit deeper into is the concept of luxury and offering a luxury 
service because we're all doing that in different ways. Obviously, we're, I think the people in the room are also looking at how they can raise their game, how they can raise their offering, how they can work with a, um, a client with a bigger budget. So I want to explore this idea of, of luxury and what we mean by that and potentially, you know, is, is that the same for everyone? What does it mean within your business? So perhaps we'll start with you, Emily. C can you um, sort of put your finger on what makes um, an experience at the Mandarin Oriental a luxurious experience. It's okay, I mean, obviously service and the amenities and all those things we offer. Um, it, it, it's gotten today with a point where you know the experience someone wants to have is so creative and so beyond. How do we adapt to that? And really, it's listening to the clientele and mm -hmm. taking them through the process. And we've seen often where we'll host a wedding at one of our hotels and they become lifelong customers, and all these celebrations mm -hmm. lead on to it. So I'd say that that would be okay. So similar in a way to perhaps what Julian was saying that it's about finding a different approach for every every you client have to really coming listen. up with and fresh they're, ideas. They're all special and they all have their unique uh, yeah. quirks, right? And they all think they're very different, uh, uh, whether it's celery salt or whatever yeah. you're dealing with. So you really have to be able to handle that sort of that level, yeah. that level of Making expectation. Uh, and you do th sometimes think, gosh, you know, you're just sleeping in this hotel. But for these people, right, maybe it's a lifetime experience that they are a milestone that they're trying to experience with us. So we okay. have to be on top of our game. Okay. Um, and so, for Elizabeth, for you, how do you think your clients would define luxury, or um, yeah, how, how, what do you think for them would say, yeah, that was a luxurious experience when I bought my cake? Um, what I've had to do over the years is to actually um, segment my clients because I can't say this is my catalogue or this is my offering mm -hmm. and choose from that. So every client is different. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed very, very early was that um, the cultures were different, <coughs> the values were different. Mm -hmm. um, they were very value-minded. Mm -hmm. So um, don't, you know, just because they've got oodles of money doesn't mean they don't want to know where every last penny um, has been. Mm -hmm. It's also generational as well. So the end client might be the couple, but the people paying the bill might be the parents. Mm -hmm. So there was a cross-generational thing as well. Um, also, you, when you get to know um, a lot of the clients, it could be a case of you're already on the short list anyway. It's just a matter of what would give you the edge over everybody else. Mm. So to some people, it could be exclusivity. Mm -hmm. um, to some people, it could be discretion. Mm -hmm. So that's where you need to manage, um, you know, for those of us who are socially, um, social media minded, um, there are certain things you sim simply can't do. Okay. So you might, you might be told um, you can't bring your handbag into the premises, okay. you can't go to a certain part. Um, and there are, you know, lots of security issues around some of the clients I deal with as well. Okay. So you need to have a conscious understanding of that. For some people, luxury is about time. Mm -hmm. um, you could get a short WhatsApp message to say, in London, need a cake in three days, this color, and that's all you have. You can't even say how many people, what's it for, mm -hmm. you just have to go with it. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, I really had to try and understand okay. um, that level of clientele and provide that service that they think is luxury. Okay, so yes. it's about really tuning in, really, really to, tuning and in. listening to what yes. they're asking for, yes. and not necessarily saying, as you say, this is my catalogue, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to, you know, within within boundaries adapt that. So that's interesting because for, for for both of you, then it's you get a lot of probably personal FaceTime, not perhaps you, Emily, personally, but your brand does with with your customers. Um, so you can create that personal connection. Um, for you, Tamara, it's not quite the same model, is it? And I know that you're the CTO of your business, and so technology is very important to you. So I'd be interested to know how you go about using technology to deliver that same sort of level of personal service and make people feel loved and understood when you don't actually necessarily meet them face to face. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, uh, luxury for the for the customer, you need to look at it in two ways. Um, obviously, getting to a product that they feel is luxurious for their budget, uh, but the the actual journey to get there needs to also feel luxurious, and that is as offline as it is online. It, it's it's taking away the friction of interacting with you. So if you're not there at the end of a WhatsApp message, if you're not there at the end of chat, if you're not available to speak to 
the, the customer because you're on holiday and they have to wait a week for a response. Mm -hmm. All of that puts up barriers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, taking away those, those pain points and those points of friction doing, during the transaction process means that they actually enjoy doing business with you. And that becomes part of the journey, mm -hmm. especially because they're planning a lovely thing when they're planning their honeymoons with us. You know, everything about planning that event uh, or their wedding should be a joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you as a company are making that difficult for them, <laughs> then that's, then it kind of mars the whole thing, mm -hmm. I think. Can you give us any examples of, of little tricks you do in your business where you think, oh yeah, we've, re we've done something there that our competitors aren't doing? Well, or... first of all, we, we always offer the chance to speak to a person. So okay. I think that putting, the, it's where the technology meets the human that, that this kind of magic connection can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how you deal with volume, right? So mm -hmm. you use the technology to become more efficient and put the customer into a human when the human can really add value, not if they're just doing some kind of menial admin task. You know, we have amazing brains as humans, and they should be used to inspire our customers okay, uh, to really take that and to add the cherry on the cake. Um, they uh, and then the technology should should just underpin that and make it easy to do. And so it's everything from you know personalization of emails. So don't bore your customers with things that are just not appropriate. Make sure that you're putting something in front of them that you think is going to you know hit the nail on the yeah. head um, and technology can enable you to do that but I mean when you think about marketing it's you know getting the right message to the right person at the right time okay that is age old it's been around far longer than the internet way longer but our ability to do that at scale and at speed now that's the bit that has changed mm. so use technology in the right way but don't take away the human. Okay. And, and how does that apply in your business, Rob? Because as you say, you're quite face-to-face -face still. <laughs> Are you doing it the good old-fashioned way? Are you using uh, yes, tech in your business? Yes, it is the old-fashioned way. And, you know, it is, you know, I sadly, sadly, in one way, I call my company Rob Van Helden, you know. Um, <laughs> people do expect to see Rob Van Helden most of the time, you know, they, because my business has become a luxury brand you know flowers mm -hmm. when i arrived here 36 years ago um i was just shocked you know, having grown up in holland and buying flowers every week for mum or whatever in england nobody you would go to a supper party and you bring a bouquet of flowers and they would go boom like yeah. that yeah and there wasn't the love for flowers like it has developed now over all these years and um so it has become a luxury like any fashion brand or whatever you know and i always say yeah, people think, oh, you're expensive. No, it's not about expensive. It's what goes with it. You know, going to the market, conditioning flowers, designing it. You know, there's a lot involved that people don't really see mm -hmm. until they get to the party. Yeah, and they don't know what's happened beforehand. And, um, you know, I've had to do the last 30 two years as well with, you know, there's new kids on the block. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, we are still going. And I have seen with people, you know, that have, use our services then they go away but they come back mm. yeah they have gone to these new kids on the block but there must be still something there that keeps them bringing back to me and it is you know it is hand holding you know like you come into for us to do your wedding you're going on a journey with a bride you know you you look after her you listen to what she like very much what like julian said like elizabeth said about discretion and all that you know it is so important you know it's uh, it's day to day and you have to to always understand it's not given to you it is hard work and you have you can't be shy of hard work and you know it is loving your job and that comes out in what you present mm -hmm. you know and uh, like i've always said you know, as long as i love my job I'll, I'll still get up at 5 a.m i don't mind and come home at seven eight o'clock so so luxury is is a is different for each of your businesses and but the thing it has in common is it's a very personalized it's a very bespoke service and i think um you know, that that's the key isn't it and that's the essence of, of of your brand isn't it and when you're clear about that from a marketing point of view i guess the other things sort of start to fall into place is is that right you'd find 
But I, I also loved what Emily was saying about you know listening to the customer, mm. because luxury does not mean the same thing to, to everybody, mm -hmm. and luxury is changing. You know that we went through a, a big stage of a lot of bling, and that was just luxury. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, when we when we did our first book, we were told we couldn't print that guidebook, and one of the reasons the publishers gave was because we wanted to print on this lovely offset paper, granular paper, and the publishers said you can't do that. You're a luxury product. You need to print on gloss. <laughs> Because that was the kind of norm. That's so then. interesting, yeah. So it's like um, a photo fit version of luxury, but it's not your own genuine. Exactly. It's just, yeah. yeah. But when you're thinking about the customers, you know, their luxury might mean something completely different to mm. yours. And uh, you know, when you're thinking about hotel stays and the weekends away that you have, you might your luxury that weekend might be a country pub with a roaring fireplace, no 24 hour mm. service, you know, but just great food and no pretense, and you can be in jeans all weekend. That is luxury. Yeah. Or you have a special occasion, you want to glam up, you want to put your Jimmy Choo's on, you want that penthouse suite in the Mandarin Oriental yeah. because you're celebrating and, you know, it's different. Mm -hmm. And that's luxury. But, but both of them are luxuries. Mm. Okay, so that's interesting because it comes down to then le Listening. Leads, leads, us, leads us neatly into the customer and what the customer's looking for. So let's, let's explore your customers in a little more detail and see if there's anything they have in common. Or, um, so for you, Emily, is there a, is there a typical um, Mandarin Oriental but, customer? I wish it was that Are easy, all, but no, it's not. Know, high net worth? No. Are they, you yeah, know? we talked about that. I mean, uh, the world, of course, is such a global marketplace and people travel now relentlessly. And as I said earlier, you know, they're trying to do their own personalized idea of what luxury is. I love what you said, right? It's either jeans or a long evening gown. Uh, you know, and as a brand, we try to, you know, one of the things that makes Mandarin special is the fact that we have such a sense of place. So whether in your Bodrum or Marrakesh mm -hmm. or New York City, you really feel like you're in the destination. Uh, but what is it anymore, right? It's, uh, the, you know, the elderly couple. It's the middle age. It's the young new money. You just really can't, you, you, you can't so define how, it So how does that... Um that's a challenge from a marketing yeah. point of view. Mm -hmm. If you can't put your audience in one neat little box and no. say, I'm going, so, so how do you address that from a marketing point of view? Gosh, I mean, of course now we're with, we're on social media in all sorts of ways, but can you imagine Mandarin Oriental now does videos, right? So you can watch these fantastic videos that give you a, a sense of place. And we just introduced a guest recognition program. We never thought we would do this. It's not about points and prizes, <laughs> but it's about our top level guests curating their own stays and what they want. We allow them to pick okay. as repeat guests. So uh, you really, you have to be nimble, right? You have to okay. constantly be so, listening yeah, and learning. And yeah. So it's responding to those needs again. Yeah. Um, and um, so Again, so I'll come back to you tomorrow because, again, you're a little bit further removed, perhaps, from your customer. Can you pigeonhole them in any way? Have you got a, are they all very wealthy? Does, do they have to be very wealthy? Or actually, <laughs> is, there, is there a relationship to be built and money to be made with people who aren't, don't fall into that? ultra high net worth category. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, Mr. and Mrs. Smith was never built as a as a very exclusive top end okay. brand. We always wanted it to feel inclusive. I mean, we're Mr. and Mrs. Smith, right? Anybody can be Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It's that <laughs> couple who are going away for that naughty weekend away. Uh, and that could be... I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that's just about sex, right? Because we're British. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, the, the, the way we look at customers is that they, all our customers are united in wanting something different, personal, special from their hotel stay. Um, they don't like cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and that kind of unites them, whether they're old, whether they're young, whether they're on date night or 50th anniversary or our Granny Smiths, we finally call them. <laughs> don't print that, please. <laughs> Um, it, uh, they're united in this search and this want of something unique, mm -hmm. and, and that's representative of you know the hotels that we work with. They're all striving so for unique. What Emily said, a sense of place. Um, so yeah. in that respect, then having a, a strong brand that people can identify through with their values, rather than because of their age or their income bracket or where they live is a better way of thinking about it then, would you say? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, and what I'm interested to hear from Rob and Elizabeth, because as, as creative businesses, um, you are working with the kind of clients that are like the holy grail, you know? Mm. And what I'd love to hear from you is, um, how did you attract 
those customers in the first place? How did you get your first big break? Um, you know, do, do you know when that happened? Can you identify it? And how did you then, you know, once you'd got the foot into the door of this sort of rather exclusive club, how did you keep the door open and, and build on that from there? So, the it, it, in our case, it was very much. Uh, it must be about twenty-five years ago. I was asked to do the royal wedding of. Um, uh, the Crown Prince of Greece, Prince Pavlos and Marie Chantal. Mm. And, you know, it was one of the biggest jobs I had ever undertaken. And um, I worked with a florist from New York on that one and various other florists from London. But we were given the major part. I met up with um, the American florist and yeah, he gave me the biggest part of it. And, you know, it was all scary, scary. But, you know, he had designed for example, all the candelabras and the metalwork and the wedding was over and he went here, this is all for you. So all of a sudden, I was left you know, with a with warehouse full of props. Full of props. Yeah, so all of a sudden, Katoink, I can take that job on or can take that job on because I've got the props. And yeah. you know, props in later life became a huge big part yeah. of my company. And uh, yeah, we now have RVH prop hire where every other florist and everybody in London comes and hires from us, which gives me the opportunity to keep on buying new ideas and new props. But um, so yeah, and then it has been by, by word of mouth and people mm -hmm. knowing that when they go to Rob Van Helden, Rob, they will see Rob Van Helden okay, nine out so of ten you think times. that really matters? Yeah. Yeah. It, it does matter, yeah. 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 And that's why I said earlier, you call mm. my company Rob Van Helden Floor Design, you know, it's a bit... <laughs> cut yeah. my own throat. Yeah, you can't you get have out to be there seven days yeah. a week. And, yeah. you know, and it, over the years as well, you, you become a control freak, you know, mm. because you've built this up. and. I'm not letting it slip away, no. you know, and it's not now like, oh, even after last week, I could take it easy now. No, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm still on cloud nine for the last week and it's given me another oomph, you know, to carry yeah. on. And, you know, yeah. I've got two little babies now to think about. So it's a whole new chapter once again. And, and that's what keeps me going. And it, the secret as well is like, each client is different. You know, we, de we deal with the bridezillas and the mother-in-laws and you name it, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you, you keep holding their hands and you make their dream come true, but it is, how would you feel if it was your wedding? And my, the, the, the nicer thing out of all is to stand behind the curtain mm -hmm. and to see the doors open yeah. and to, for them to walk in. Yeah. And it's not receiving the check the next day, no, it's receiving that thank you letter. Oh, yeah. yeah. And over 30 years, I've kept all of them. And it, that's what keeps you going and it keeps getting you up each morning and it's it's the gratitude but it is remember you are the florist you're not some celebrity or whatever okay. no but it is true you know and yeah. but you know, did that that very first royal wedding did it fall out of the sky or had you been chasing it like bonkers was it I a had, lucky no, break they or? chased me it was uh, through mutual friends yeah and i was put forward but i so never was thought right time, i was going right to get place. that big part and, Pardon yeah. me? It was right time, right place. Right time, yeah. right place. So. And it just developed from there. And from, from then, it was all by word of mouth before, you know, Instagram and Facebook and yeah. everything yeah. else. And, you know, I, I have never worked with a PR company. You know, it's, you are your own PR at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. You know, and well, and I think also when you get to the, to the level that you're at now, as you say, the word of mouth, the business hopefully comes to you. And, and that's, yeah. that's the don't dream. Don't take it? it all for granted. You know, we have been in these 30 yeah. years through recessions, you know, mm. and through having to remortgage the houses and you name it you know to keep the company mm. going but it's like it, it's like having a baby you don't want to let go of that baby you've mm. worked so hard for it and you're not going to let it slip away it, it's it's your, my life you know yeah. it's uh, and every day I, I still pinch myself you know for all the opportunities that people have given us and my team you know for going like Julian's jobs in Mexico in the Maldives and with Jamie all over the South France and you name it everywhere it is mind-blowing because each job is different mm -hmm. you know and each client is different and you just have to be uh, what you call humanitarian to, to deal with all kinds of people yeah yeah but the the gratitude afterwards is what keeps you going okay thank you and um elizabeth how about you can you pinpoint the bit where you went god yeah that was my lucky break that was when things turned around for me um kind of um but mine is um slightly different because um i had well i i keep saying this i had an old mixer 40 quid in the bank <laughs> and i'd just been made redundant from my job as a headhunter and the one thing about being a headhunter was, um, while I was doing that job, we had to make 100 phone calls a week mm -hmm. um, to clients, and we had to have about 10 meetings a week with clients. 
So great I, training. Great <laughs> training. So um, this was this was when um, Google was you know had just started out. Yeah. Um, there was no social media. I think Facebook might be early days. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember um, the first thing I tried to do was make friends with people within the. Um, UK wedding industry and I didn't get any responses so I made friends with people abroad so the girls from Spain Venezuela so I made friends with people all over the world um, America so that was absolutely fantastic um, it turned out that in the end um, it was a great opportunity for me to expand the brand into those countries mm -hmm. um, Eastern Europe as well they were very receptive towards my cakes and then I picked up the phone and I literally was making you know, tens of calls every day okay. till I called um, a company called Party Planners run by Lady Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And there was a young girl at the end in tears and she said something like, do you make cupcakes? We've tried 10 cupcake companies and none of them are good. Um, I said, yes, we do. And, um, <laughs> and I said, how to make cupcakes. Make cupcakes. <laughs> and I said, as it happens, we're going to be in your area in three days. I didn't want to say following day or whatever. So, so I gave myself time to source the nicest looking boxes, um, do a couple of flavors, package mm. them. And then I acted like the delivery girl because sometimes um, it's natural for us to want to sell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I do not sell my cakes. Instead, I want to know what your problems are. I want to know, you know, who you are, you know, what you, you know, what are your requirements? So I focus on you. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just said, oh, you know, delivery from Elizabeth's Cake Emporium. And I dropped, left the cards and I zoomed off. And by the time I got home, I got the job. And I remember it very well. It wasn't a huge amount of money because for that particular party, they had three other cake makers. But I got an amazing note back from Lady Elizabeth saying, your cakes tasted the best. They were the best, um, you know, yada, yada. She didn't have to write that note, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that that was another marketing tool that I took from her in that, you know, writing, you know, an old fashioned note on amazing paper. It came back to me and she said, you can use this as part of your marketing. And I did and I still do. And um, a few, you know, so I kept in touch with her and I, she gave me loads of jobs. And recently I got another job from her and she was like, I still remember you. I still remember, you know, the circumstances, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was one of, you know, that I could pinpoint to say um, it, it kind of, I wouldn't say the orders came flooding in after that. But it kind of kept me going. It was a step. It was a, it was a step. It, yeah, open. it was a step. So um, it's been a slow, a slow burn. Very slow, yeah, yeah. Um, very slow, very gradual. And um, because, you know, as Rob said, um, no PR, you know, company, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And another thing is you need to, when you're competing, you need to compete with your own tools. It's easy to say, my competitor is doing X, Y, Z, I need to do X, Y, Z, and you get into a panic. Mm -hmm. But for me, because I'm the underdog, I say to myself, this is a David Goliath situation, I need to use my own tools. Because if you try to compete on somebody else's tools, mm -hmm. um, they're not going to fit you because they're not. So you need to know what you're good at, what you're not good at, and then use those um, to compete. That's it, and that's the essence of a strong and that's brand, the, isn't And it? that is yeah. the essence of um, being authentic, in my yeah. view. Yeah. That is being, you know, authentic, in my view, and that is what would keep your clients coming back. Your clients will go away, because um, in terms of luxury, they're always looking for the new thing, the unique. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking for something new, and they will go and try something new, and your heart will break a little, but they'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay. And so from a marketing point of view, now you're in a position where, you know, you're a well-known brand and presumably business comes to you. What do you do actively do in terms of uh, marketing? Do you have a marketing strategy? Do you, you know, what are your daily marketing plans? Um, for me, if a, if a market becomes saturated, I think of something else. Okay. Because sometimes um, you can either go down into the mosh pit and... Oh, you mean with people doing with similar things to you? So doing you similar to things, say, okay, or, you know, similar services, yeah. or, or in a particular geographical location, or, yeah. or, or for example, everybody might say, yep, yeah, we're, we're all, you know, going to London, 
I'm going to become a London photographer, whatever, you know, I'm going to have a London address, blah, blah, blah. So mosh pit, you know, I wouldn't do that. Okay. You know, if everyone's rushing to, I would not do that. Um, I would find another market very little. You know, I'm always looking for emerging markets. Okay, that's so interesting. So um, you're always, you've got always your eye, eye ahead. ahead. Also, yeah. emerging venues, for example. Okay. Um, you know, emerge, and there, honestly, I, if there was social media when I started, I mean, that would have made my life easy. You know, no more phone calls, nothing. So there are ways in which you can tell if there's an emerging venue, emerging market, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you start having those conversations. You start having those chats. Um, for example, um, Instagram stories, um, you know, it's a fantastic way um, to know what's going, you know, to know the real deal about what's going on with people. Mm -hmm. And not many people are using Instagram stories to its fullest and not many people are actually actively thinking, even just commenting regularly on Instagram stories. Because if you comment on the page and there are a thousand likes and 525 comments, your comment is lost. Mm -hmm. But Instagram stories is even more immediate. Mm -hmm. um, same thing knowing that on Twitter, for example, certain people are there that you can reach out to directly. Mm -hmm. um, because everyone's like, oh, Instagram is where it's at. You know, Facebook is dead. Twitter's dead. I say no. Each social media platform serves a need. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what is it on each platform that you can get um, and you build a relationship don't know why you're using it. Why you're, you're using it, it? What relationship do you, do you want to build? Does it bring you business? Would you say you get oh business? Oh my from god! Instagram? Absolutely. Yeah. Via Facebook, which, mm -hmm. I, which is shocking because mm -hmm. everyone thinks Facebook is dead. Mm -hmm. I get business from Facebook. I get via Instagram all the time. Okay. And sometimes um, we try to force people to communicate with us the way we want to be communicated with. So if you get a random message on WhatsApp, for example, saying, "How much is a cake?" How do you evaluate whether the client is luxury or not? However, I don't know why, but there's an instinct, there's a tone, mm -hmm. and there's always a name. So even just basic Google research. Um, now, because I was a headhunter, I don't use Google the way a lot of people use Google. Mm -hmm. There are other features on Google where you can know if someone oh, is really who they are. Uh -huh. So you can actually, and you can also do related searches so that name that person's name is in the middle and then you search around the person the people they're linked to okay. so there's that aspect as well right so a lot of it is the um i don't know you know again I, I, for lack of a better word strategic planning mm -hmm. in terms of a person yeah so you can you know do so by the time you do okay is it six degrees of separation Yes, you know, yeah, that's yes. right. Yeah. Three, now, three, three, now, three, okay, three yeah. nowadays. <laughs> so by the time you do the three degrees of separation, you can, you can tell who they are, who they're not. Mm. Um, and then the other day, I realized for some reason, my brides were a particular occupation and a particular, you know, so although they're culturally different, mm. but they had similarities. So I don't know if that made any sense at all, but yeah, that's, no, that's how it. I... Yeah, well, I think it comes back to that thing about, um, you know, if you have to group people, you're grouping them around their values and their, their likes rather than their, their rather demographics than, yeah. and, and that's so on. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Rob, how about you? Do you do any active marketing other than just turning no. up to work every day and uh, <laughs> delivering a great service? I mean, do you... No, I've got the girls in the office. Uh, I, I've got my own personal Instagram, which... I share my work on. Mm -hmm. and then there's the RVH floor design, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, yeah. and all that. And you know, like you said, you know, it's very much you. You build up a reputation, and you want to keep that reputation. And like I said earlier as well, with new kids on the block and all that, people will come to you. Yes, you have to be flexible in business, but to a certain point as well. You know, it's like if if my heart is not into a design, <laughs> yeah, then I'd rather not do the job mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the end product. It's not me. It's a bit like you can either go to Valentino or you can go to Primark, yeah? And certain things, it's like, I try to be as flexible as I possibly can to make every job the best we've ever done. But certain points, your reputation needs to be kept intact. And, um, and yeah, we do bring that through with Instagram, yeah, all the social media, Twitter, and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing every day. Okay. So, but uh, funny enough, I only started with Instagram probably a year and a half, two years ago. I didn't have a clue what to do with Doing it. Doing the so, club, uh, but yeah. But now uh, you, know, you get hooked. Yeah, you, uh, I know, uh, I know. It's a whole way of life. And it is very much thanks to our suppliers as well and clients for sharing what yeah. we have done for them. I think that's a really that your big name part gets of it, out isn't there. it? And, 
you know, in the last week I've been extremely lucky and it's with the publicity and everything, you mm. know, but... Uh, and before last week, it was like, oh my God, if things go wrong, I'm going to be over on bloody Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sleepless night. So, um, yeah, it can take every effect, mm. can't it? Just so. in case anyone doesn't know, which I'm sure you all do, um, Rob did the flowers for the royal wedding on Friday for um, Amongst Princess... Amongst other flowers, but yeah, we yeah. did do the mm -hmm. major part. Yeah. 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 And the bridal, your sister did the bridal bouquet, didn't she? My sister did the bridal bouquet, yeah. of which I'm lovely. very proud. And the trees didn't blow over. And the trees didn't blow <laughs> over. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> you know you're yeah, yeah. um, <laughs> And um, tomorrow, I'm sure you're also, you know, with, with your tech head on, you're thinking ahead. Um, in terms of marketing strategies for your business, is there anything that you've done that bombed or anything that you're planning that's really exciting or emerging? Or what are you doing on a tactical level, sort of day-to-day -day with your marketing? Yeah, so... Um, well, of course we do all the digital marketing, but um, again, I, th I find it very hard. But there's certain Instagram especially is, is very good at making connections, but making a, a human connection uh, to, with the customer is very, very difficult in the digital space. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, especially in America, which is our big target market for next year, uh, in fact, we just raised six million on Crowdcube to um, expand uh, there. Um, most of the marketing plans <laughs> most of the marketing plans um, are not us you know giving money to Google or it's very much uh, member events activations getting getting to know our customers mm -hmm. on a much more intimate level um, as you listening to you talk about the handwritten notes you know there's a company out there who does handwritten notes at scale um, her name is Charlotte Pierce and she runs a company called Ink Pact and she has a network of stay-at-home mums, ex-convicts. She grades all their handwriting oh, from geeky, you know, messy oh, writing to, to romantic, to romantic yeah. script. Mm. And she has technology. You put in your message, your customer details, and at scale you can have a 1,000 handwritten fantastic. notes sent out. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And we're using it for our members and all our members' events. And if you think about it, who's not going to open yeah. that? Yeah piece of so you know, that envelope. Beautifully retro. I love oh, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's and so I, I do think there is a return, you know, just as we're seeing certain magazines really well done and, and reinvented. Mm -hmm. They're not the magazines of old, mm. but the ones that are coming back and doing really well. And it's the, the power of the physical face to face, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a world where automation, we can't stop this automation technology, but the companies that, that put the human at the heart of their business, are the ones that are going to be more resilient, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. We were, I was talking to someone on the bus earlier about how outsourcing your um, social media is not really a thing anymore. But yeah. you remember a few years ago, that was a thing, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. You know, oh, I'll just get someone else to do my... And it, it's kind of unthinkable now. Yeah. But, and that's why you're doing it, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, because there's just no the other authenticity way. Yeah, goes, it, it, yeah. It, because the, I think your audience would just see straight through it otherwise. So... Um, and Emily, how about uh, Mandarin Oriental? Perfect What's segue. I'm just thinking. Um, <laughs> What's exciting I'm on sure the horizon? Some of you maybe have been lucky enough to experience a Mandarin Oriental spa, which is quite quite something. And once we get the Mandarin Oriental open London in December, that will Yay. be back. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Roll on yeah. December. Um, but we were listening to our clients. You know, we do a lot of mice business, not just beautiful celebrations and all those good things, but also, you know, corporate meetings. And the planners were telling us this whole idea of mindfulness, right? Mindful, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're working so hard at home to be healthy and fit, and now you're going to go on the road and jet lag. And so we essentially are bringing the spa into the hotel, so you can, into the meeting, so you can have yoga breaks and, uh, I don't know, we do paddleboard yoga in Atlanta and all sorts of cool things, and healthy menu options, as much or as little as you want. Well, it's become, you know, we've just been trial running this since June, and we've actually gone out to our clients to talk about it. Now they're trying to bring it into their corporate offices and bring mindfulness in. So as it applies to you, right, listening to your customers, what they want to do. They want to have a beautiful, healthy wedding. We could do that for them. You want to have a hen party, and you're going to have your cake, of course, and your champagne and your flowers, but you can still have your juice breaks. So we're trying to adapt to that new demographic, which is all about health. It's not so much the bling and the champagne showers, but yeah. juicing and kale yeah. salads. So okay. adapting. <laughs>
Okay, well, I think um, we, we're almost uh, done time-wise. And, and to sort of sum up, I think what I'm getting from this is that that, that create, you know, the, the creativity that is inherent in what you're putting out through your products and your services is, is also there in everything you're doing yeah. to market your business. It's almost instinctive. You're almost so, no, you're doing it, but I think if you can harness the creativity that you put out through your work and use that same to power um, the, the, the logic and the thinking and the output between, behind your marketing, you actually come up with quite a powerful recipe, but I think more importantly, a really authentic and unique um, offering that is going to stand out amongst the competition. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what you're each doing um, with, your, with your brands. And... Um, so thank you all so much for sharing thank with us. I think that's been fascinating for me, and uh, I, I hope there will be plenty of questions. So I'd like to hand over questions. Thank, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I was very, um, you know, from Elizabeth. I, I, you, you said something, and it's really intrigued me. You said that your client had very, you know, a lot of similarity between each other. Um, I have about 90% of my clients that are doing the same job. And I was just intrigued and interested how, I mean, why do you think it's that in your case it might be somehow resembling to, to me as well? I mean, why do you think you get the say, this, those similarity? Because sometimes I'm asking my clients, every time they're telling me they have a specific job, I say, okay, this is going to become a client because somehow I always get those, you know, those people. And I'm just wondering how... You know, it's wise for you. Maybe it's, it's got some relation with me. Um, I think I attract um, clients who don't have a lot of time. So they don't want to sit and taste about a thousand cake flavors. They're very decisive. Um, they trust the brand that, they've, that they will eventually choose to execute whatever it is they need to execute. And um, they, because they're so specialist in what they do, they trust another specialist. And I think sometimes, um, as a professional, that needs to come across that I do know what I'm doing, even if you don't. <laughs> because sometimes, um, especially if you're starting out, um, you're not quite sure. And I say to people, it's the equivalent of going to a GP, and if the GP tells you, actually, I'm just fresh out of medical school, um, and I really haven't seen anything like this. Um, <laughs> you're, you know, you're not going to have a lot of trust in them. But if, but you know, and in most cases where um, there's, you know, sometimes a diagnosis. Because I, I used to be again, my background. I used to be a, a biomedical scientist. And there are times when the doctors have no clue what is wrong with the patient. As in, we have no clue. We've run every test, but we don't know. So we will put something like unexplained diagnosis or that means it's a failure on our part i.e. we couldn't tell what was wrong with the patient um, but in this industry you can't convey that to your client um, you've got to convey you know you know what you're doing you know what you're worth you know this is what we're going to you know, this is what's going to happen we're going to listen to you we're going to create something amazing for you so with my particular those particular brides um, in fact um, recently I had about five in a row they didn't even bother with a meeting. They just said, yep, yeah, we trust what you're doing. Just do it. Um, and, you know, thankfully, all went well. So I think, I don't know, it's whatever you convey, I suppose, you know, whatever you put out there is what you attract. So you think it's a matter of attraction, not really... Uh, you I, know, think, like I think it's attraction in terms of the messages, you know, in terms of your marketing, the messages. Yeah, no, I was thinking, yeah. you know, that you had more technical things. So for you, it would be marketing. I think it would be, it yeah. would be marketing. And remember that before you make it onto a short list, your potential client has gone through so many channels. So it could be word of mouth. They come to your website through Google. They come to your website through um, your social media. They come to your website maybe via another supplier, for example. Um, so they've come. So you know. So you need to think of the multi. You know. You literally need to do a mind map mm -hmm. of how many ways will a client come to me. You know, because a lot of people. The question I get asked is, how do I attract um, high net worth? How do I attract? But the truth is, sometimes the high, high net worth they come to you, and 
you know, a simple, simple example is um, beautiful images. Um, it could be a matter of the same glass, but in a different light. Um, beautiful images attract, the right hashtags attract, the right word of mouth attracts, the right sharing on um, the right social media platform, the right blogger, um, but you don't know until you experiment. Um, so, you know, that's what I think. Beautiful website, everybody. <laughs> Check out our website. And don't you think in, in this industry you create almost like little families where you very happily recommend, recommend yeah. you know, yes. somebody will come to me and say, can you recommend a party planner? So I have party plans or a cake, you know, I'm very happy to recommend Elizabeth. And it's, it's like you look after each other in this yeah. business and, uh, you know, that's how you keep on going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any others? Zoe. Thanks. So does that mean nowadays there's no need for paid advertising? It's all word of mouth? Ah, now that's, that's, an interesting, um, that's an interesting one. If you do paid advertising, this is what you need a unicorn. You need, and, I, and I'll explain what a unicorn is in the world of um, SEO and paid advertising. You need someone, an SEO person or someone or whatever, that understands how to market luxury. So for example, if you say, my client likes Valentino, which would buy her shoes from Jimmy Choo, would buy her, I don't know, celery salt from Selfridges, <laughs> will buy, the, you know, so you literally need to know what their habits are, <coughs> what they do, etc. So this SEO person has to make sure that they're marketing to that type of person. So you need to do the marketing in a, in a way. So I, for example, one of my favorite brands is Chanel. Every time Chanel does a fashion show, they do it outside the box. So the last time it was a beach, they brought the beach to Paris. Mm -hmm. Everybody was talking about that. So within your world, whatever it is you do, you need to think, what can I do that's different? Now, my world is a backyard, for example, and I, I'm happy to put myself out there. My world is just a, somebody's backyard. Somebody's backyard, I imagined the most amazing tulip field you could ever see. And we brought it to life, we did the shoot, and boom, every, and, um, every spring, a lot of bloggers will share that photo. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, you know, you're talking to someone with, I have no money, <laughs> as in, you know, I don't have this, you know, rich pockets some, or deep pockets, but it's about making the most of the little you have and saying to yourself, we need to create something that people are gonna talk about how, what can we do and how can we time it? Did another thing, um, the Frida Kahlo shoot, and we timed it so that the day of the exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum, that was the day we released the shoot. One image, we tagged them, we tagged everybody, and boom, it was shared and shared and shared. And you know, people didn't even wait to ask us. So that's what I'm trying to say. So with collaboration with the right people, because not everyone is so like-minded, Collaboration with the right people um, who see the same vision, you know, you can actually make waves without having to spend a lot of money.